Chapter Fifteen of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, The Alibi. Twenty minutes later, having satisfied himself that the immediate neighborhood was free of passers-by for the moment and that he had not been observed, he tried the street door of the tenement that had been the subject of Whitey Jack's earlier investigations. The door was unlocked, and he stepped silently into the vestibule and closed the door softly behind him. He stood for a moment, listening, and taking critical note of his surroundings. A single incandescent burning here in the lower hall supplied ample illumination. The stairs were directly in front of him, and on the right of the hallway. There was a closed door also on the right and just at the foot of the stairs, and from behind this there came the murmur of voices. There was no other sound. He moved quietly forward, mounted the stairs, gained the landing, and with more caution now turned back along the hall, making for the door on the right. Peter's door, according to Whitey Jack, that, if in the same relative location as the one below, would be at the foot of the next flight of stairs. A faint light came up through the stairwell, but the end of the hall itself, beyond the second flight of stairs, was in blackness. He nodded grimly in satisfaction. He would not need any light to find Peter's door. His lips pressed hard together. He had reached the door now, and now he crouched against it, his ear to the panel. He listened intently. A sudden doubt came and tormented him and obsessed him. What if by any chance Peter's had someone with him? A bead of moisture oozed out on his forehead, and he brushed it hurriedly away. He was not so callous now. Behind that door lay literally life and death. Behind that door, if it proved necessary, he meant to take a man's life, a miserable life, it was true, a murderer's life, a life that had no claim to mercy, but still a man's life. Had he ever laid claim to being callous? But that did not mean that his resolution was being undermined. The issue tonight was clearly defined, ultimate, final, and he had accepted that issue and he would see it through. His lips relaxed a little in a smile of self-mockery. Well, suppose Peters were not alone. He, Billy Kane, had only to wait until the visitor conjured up by his doubts had gone. He steadied himself with a mental effort. His nerves were getting a little too high-strung. To begin with, there wasn't anybody in there with Peters. He would have heard voices if there had been, and he had heard none. He glanced around him now, but the act was wholly one of exaggerated caution. Here at the end of the hall he could see nothing. Opposite him was probably the door of the other apartment on this floor that Whitey Jack had said was unoccupied. There was no fear of interruption. He took his automatic from his pocket, tried the door cautiously, and, finding it locked, knocked softly with his knuckles on the panel. There was no response. He knocked again a little louder, more insistently. There was still no response. Billy Kane was gnawing at his under lip now. Not only had Peters no visitor, but even Peters himself was not there. Out of the darkness it seemed as though a horde of mocking devils were suddenly jeering at him in unholy glee. He had somehow been very sure that everything tonight would go as he had planned, and instead there had been nothing so far but stark futility. But the night had not ended yet. He thrust the automatic abruptly back into his pocket. There was still time for Peters to come. It was only a little after nine, and Peters would have a visitor after all, a visitor waiting there inside that room for him. Billy Kane drew Whitey Jack's bunch of skeleton keys from his pocket, and crouching now low down in front of the door, inserted one of the keys in the lock. It would not work. He tried another, with the same result, he was not an adept at lock-picking as yet. He grinned without mirth at the mental reservation, and suddenly drew back from the door, retreating into the deeper blackness at the end of the hall. Here was Peters now, and Peters would have much less trouble in opening the door. Footsteps were ascending the stairs. A figure, in the murky light from the stairwell, gained the landing and came forward along the hall. Billy Kane's sudden smile held little of humor. It was not Peters. 
It was Whitey Jack's tenant of the third floor, Savnak, the old violin player, hugging his violin case under his arm, and, as he came into the shadows, feeling out with his other hand for the banisters of the second flight of stairs. Fifteen feet away, flattened against the wall, himself secure from observation in the darkness, Billy Kane, in a sort of grim philosophical resignation, watched what was now little more than a shadowy outline, as the other went on up the stairs to the third floor. A door above slammed shut. Billy Kane returned to Peter's door. Again he tried a key, and still another, until, with a low-breathed ejaculation of satisfaction, he finally unlocked the door. He exchanged the keys for his automatic once more, and once more, his hand on the doorknob, he held tense and motionless, listening. From below there came again the sound of footsteps on the stairs. It was Peter's at last, probably. But if it was Peter's, Peter's was not alone. The footsteps of two men were on the stairs. Futility again. The door was unlocked, but it availed him nothing at all now. He had meant to go in and wait for Peter's, but it would be a fool play from any angle to go in there now if Peter's had anybody with him. Nor was there time to lock the door again. He had returned the bunch of keys to his pocket, and it would take a moment to sort out the right one, and there was not that moment to spare. The footsteps were already on the landing. Billy Kane drew back once more, silently and swiftly, to the front of the hall. He was tight-lipped now. It seemed as though every turn of the luck had gone against him. Peters was certain to notice that the door was unlocked. What effect would that have on Peters? What would the man do? And— Billy Kane was staring down the hall in a numbed, dazed way. Two men had come into the radius of light from the stairwell, and were moving quickly along the hall in his direction. He brushed his hand across his eyes. That little horde of devils were at their jeers of unholy mirth again. Peters! There was no such man as Peters. Peters was a myth. The whole cursed night was a series of damnable hallucinations. This wasn't Peters. It was Red Vallon and Bertie Rose. Out of the darkness he watched them, his mind fogged. What were they doing here? Why had they become suddenly so quiet and stealthy as they went up that second flight of stairs, where Savnak had gone? Savnak. Vetter. The Diamonds. Red Vallon. He remembered the tribute paid to the Mole's cleverness, a tribute that in his estimation as an eyewitness to the theft had come far from being borne out in practice. Was there something that he had not seen, something behind that bald, crude scene which he had witnessed? His brain was stumbling on, groping, striving for understanding. He remembered the code message. The Mole was to divert suspicion to someone else. Had the Mole in some way outwitted Red Vallon? Birdie Rose and Red Vallon obviously believed that the old violinist had the diamonds. There was no other possible explanation to account for their presence here hard on Savnak's trail. And if that were so, it would go hard with Savnak, very hard indeed. When believing Savnak was lying, Red Vallon failed to secure the stones. Red Vallon was not a man to trifle with. Red Vallon was perhaps the most dangerous and unscrupulous gangster in New York, and— Billy Kane was creeping forward, and mounting the stairs, step by step, with infinite caution. They had disappeared now into Savnak's room, presumably. He had no choice, had he? The manhandling they would give Savnak would be little short of murder. Murder. His lips tightened. There was to have been murder in that room below there, wasn't there? But that was different. One man was guilty, the other innocent. Much as it meant to him to settle with Peters, he had no choice but to let that go tonight now, if necessary, to let it go, if necessary, until tomorrow, or until he could formulate some other plan for it was not likely that he could frustrate Red Vallon now, and still be left quietly to return to a reckoning with Peters. His fingers closed in a sudden spasmodic clutch over the stock of his automatic. He had passed Peters' door, had left it unlocked, and Peters might come in the meantime. Well, it didn't matter now. His own luck was out. The night had done nothing but toss him hither and thither like a shuttlecock in mockery and sport. 
and at the last fate had played him this most scurvy trick of all he could not stand aside and see an innocent man left to the mercy of a devil like red vallon and so instead of playing billy kane to peters he was playing the man in the mask to red vallon and birdie rose and that jeering horde of imps out in the darkness were shrieking in his ears again he slid his mask over his face he had reached the door over peter's flat which whitey jack had described as sapnax red vallon had failed to close it tightly behind him perhaps unwilling to risk the chance of any additional sound it was slightly ajar a dull glow of light as though from an inner room seeped through the aperture came a sharp startled exclamation and then red vallon's voice snarling viciously come on come across and come quick billy kane pushed the door open inch by inch and suddenly slipped into the room he was quite safe providing he made no noise that would betray his presence across from him at an angle that kept him out of the line of sight was the open door of what was obviously the front room of the apartment savnak had evidently been flung violently down into a chair birdie rose's fingers were crooked claw-like within an inch of the violinist's throat and red vallon leaning on a table in front of the two was leering at savnak in ugly menace savnak was speaking low and earnestly but billy kane could not catch the man's words red vallon interrupted the other with scant ceremony can that he snarled it don't go that stagehand of yours ain't got the goods you got em well wise to your game we know you bertie and me and you know we know it how long you been cultivating that old dutchman and waiting for something worth while like tonight to break loose pinochle and a violin <laughs> pretty nifty that violin stunt it helped us a lot we got in the same as that boob of yours did while you was making enough noise fiddling to let an army in without being heard sure you got a tricky nut on your shoulders all right it's too bad though you don't know enough not to stack up against a better crowd and the guy turned out the gas to help him in his getaway did he yes he did like hell that's where he slipped you the sparklers old bucko well we've got your number ain't we we hung around after that to give you a chance to finish out the play we're with you there nothing suits us better than to have the police chasing some guy they don't know and they ain't got the white ones anyhow come on now come across billy kane like a man bewildered mentally stunned stood there motionless a sing-song refrain repeated itself crazily over and over in his brain savnak was the mole savnak was the mole he lifted his hand and swept it across his eyes savnak's face in there in that room was working in a sort of livid fury yes of course savnak was the mole it was quite clear now quite plain and the mole was not lacking quite so much after all in craft and cunning so red vallon had been in betters too and he there came a sudden grim set to billy kane's lips well at least the diamonds were here now savnak was speaking again who put you wise to this he demanded sullenly i don't know said the gangster indifferently i got orders that's all maybe some of our crowd piped you off making your play with dutchy during the last month and figured two and two made twenty-three for you or maybe one of your own bunch whispered out loud i don't know are you coming across without getting hurt or aren't you billy kane was moving softly toward the inner door savnak had apparently regained his composure he looked from one to another of his captors and forced a smile look here he said ingratiatingly we're all in this so suppose we play fair i'm willing to split huh do you hear that birdie jeered red vallon with a nasty laugh he wants a split well give him one maybe it'll help him to get a move on twist his pipes a little more that's the sort of split he won't argue over birdie rose's two hands closed with a quick ugly jerk on savnak's throat there was a gurgling cry wait savnak choked out hey it's all right boys he rubbed his throat as bertie rose released him i know when i'm beaten he shrugged his shoulders in a sort of philosophically fantastic way 
and reaching into his inside coat pocket threw Vetter's chamois pocketbook down on the table. "'That's the stuff,' grunted Red Vallon maliciously. "'But seeing it's you, we'll just take a look at it and make sure you're honest.' He picked up the pocketbook, opened it, nodded, and chuckled over the gleaming array of diamonds, and closed the pocketbook again. "'Well, I guess that'll be all for tonight, Mr. Sabnak, and—' His words ended in a sudden gasp. Billy Kane was standing in the doorway, his automatic covering the men. "'Don't move, please, any of you,' Billy Kane's voice, gruffly unrecognizable, was facetiously debonair. Birdie Rose's face had gone a pasty white. Savnak, hunched in his chair, stared helplessly. Red Vallon, his jaw dropped, still holding the pocket-book, found his voice. "'The man in the mask,' he mumbled. "'I was a little late for the tombola myself at Vetter's tonight,' said Billy Kane coolly. "'I understand you were all there. I only got as far as the backyard when the gathering broke up, and I was a little disappointed because I had a hunch that I held the winning number. However, if you, there with the pocket-book, whatever your name is, We'll just toss the prize over here. I'm willing to overlook any slight irregularity there might have been in the drawing. Red Vallon did not answer. The muzzle of Billy Kane's automatic lifted to a level with the gangster's eyes. Did you hear me? The facetiousness was gone from Billy Kane now. His voice rasped suddenly. Toss it over. With an oath, Red Vallon flung the pocketbook over the table. Billy Kane caught it deftly with his left hand. "'Thank you,' said Billy Kane politely. He tucked the chamois case into his pocket and reached for the doorknob. "'I think that is all, gentlemen,' he said softly, "'except to wish you good night.' In a flash he had shut the door upon them, and turning was running across the outer room. But Red Vallon, too, was quick. Before Billy Kane reached the door leading into the hall, he heard the window of the front room flung up and Red Vallon's voice. "'Quick, boys, come in!' A man in the mask. Head him off. Jump for it. He's going downstairs. Billy Kane's jaws clamped hard as he swung through the door to the head of the stairs. It was true. He remembered that Red Vallon had said he had some of his gang with him. He could hear them now. They were running into the lower hall, and though he was taking the stairs three and four at a time, they would meet on the lower staircase if he kept on. His escape was cut off. There was only one chance. Peter's door. It was unlocked. Peter's door, before Red Vallon above opened the door of Savnak's flat and saw him. It had been a matter of seconds, no more, but seconds that had seemed of interminable duration. He was at the foot of the stairs now. Came the pounding of approaching feet from below. Red Vallon, whether because he had not had time or because he was wary of a trap, had not opened the door into the hall above yet. Billy Kane, cautious of any sound, slipped through the door into Peter's flat. Half drew back in sudden dismay. Then... Grimly closed the door behind him softly, and working with desperate haste now, and still silently, took out his skeleton keys and locked it. He turned, then, with his automatic flung out in front of him, and faced the door that opened on his left. He knew it, of course, but he had been too late to turn back. He was doubly trapped. His lips, thinned, curved into a bitter smile. If there was any murder to be done in this flat tonight, it was likely now to be his own, not Peter's. There was a light in that room. Peters must have come in while he, Billy Kane, was upstairs. He was between two fires. A cry, any alarm given by Peters, would bring Red Vallon in his blood-fanged pack bursting through that door behind him. Was Peters deaf? True, he, Billy Kane, had slipped in as silently through that door as he could, and had locked it silently as he could. But he must have made some noise. Feet raced by in the hall and went thumping up the stairs. It was strange that Peters had not heard him. It was stranger still that Peters did not hear the commotion now that Red Vallon's pack was making. Billy Kane moved forward stealthily until he could see into the lighted room, and stood suddenly still. He felt the blood leave his face. He lifted his hand to his eyes in a queer, jerky, horrified motion, and then with a low cry he ran forward into the other room. The place was in confusion. It was a bedroom, and bureau drawers had been wrenched out and thrown around, every possible receptacle that might have concealed the smallest object had been ransacked and looted, and the contents strewn in wild disorder everywhere about. And on the floor a man lay sprawled, dead, murdered, 
a brutal wound in the side of his head from a blow that had apparently fractured his skull. He knelt for a moment over the man. It was Peter's. He rose then and stood there, fighting to rouse his brain from blunted torpor, to force it to resume its normal functions. Peters had been lying here dead all the time that he, Billy Kane, had been waiting outside there in the hall. It must have taken quite a little while to have accomplished this murder and ransack the room. Peters, therefore, must have left the Ellsworth house earlier than usual, since the murderer, allowing for the length of time he would have required for his work, must have completed it and made his escape before he, Billy Kane, had arrived here at nine o'clock. It was very strange, horribly strange, to find Peters murdered. Who was it? Who had done it? Who was it other than himself who could have had any motive? What did it mean? What was it that Peters had had here that had been the object of such a frantic search? Billy Kane drew his breath in suddenly, sharply. What could it be save one thing? The Ellsworth rubies? That's what it was, wasn't it? Rubies. A sound from somewhere out in the hall brought surging back upon him a realization of his own imminent peril. There must be some way out. He must find a way. If he knew Red Vallon at all, he knew that he, Billy Kane, would never leave by the door. Well, a, a fire escape, then, perhaps. Quick now, every faculty alert, he ran noiselessly from room to room and from window to window. He returned a moment later to the hall door, his face a little harder set and strained. There was no escape by the windows. There was nothing, except an increasing sound of disturbance that seemed to be affecting all parts of the house. Nothing save Red Vallon's voice just outside the door, talking, evidently, to some of his men. He ain't got out. And he ain't going to get out till we've searched every flat in this place. He's most likely on this floor, and Bertie and me'll tackle this door here first. But you go down there and tell those people below to shut up their row, and some of you look through their rooms. Beat it! Footsteps scurried away. The doorknob was tried. Billy Kane's lips were in a thin line. There was no physical way of escape. Was there a way of wits? His wits against Red Valens? He stood there motionless, a queer grim look creeping into his face as the door now was shaken violently. And then, suddenly, he jerked his mask from his face and thrust it into his pocket. Yes, there was a way, but a way that held a something of ghastly, abysmal irony in it. He could prove an alibi. He had a witness to it. The door quivered, but held under a crashing blow. Then read Vallon's growling voice. Get out of the road, Bertie, and let me at it. I'll bust it in. And then Billy Kane spoke. Is that you, Red? He demanded harshly. There was a surprised gasp from the hall without, a second's tense silence, and then Red Vallon's voice again, heavy with perplexity and amazement. Who in hell are you? Billy Kane unlocked the door, flung it open, and stepped back. The hall had been lighted now, evidently to facilitate Red Vallon's search, and the light fell full upon Billy Kane through the doorway. The rat! The gangster's little red-rimmed eyes blinked helplessly, then suddenly narrowed. What are you doing here? You fool! snarled Billy Kane angrily. I thought I recognized your voice. You gave me a scare. What are you doing here? That's, what's all this cursed noise about? What's it about? repeated Red Vallon mechanically. He spoke automatically, as though through force of habit at the Rat's command. The Mole lives upstairs. He got those diamonds from Vetter, when Bertie and me took them from him, and not five minutes ago that blasted man in the mask turned the trick on us, and— His voice changed with a jerk and became suddenly truculent. It's damn funny where he got to. Come in here, both of you, ordered Billy Kane peremptorily. Come in here and shut the door. Now, as they obeyed him— that's the story, is it, Red? Well, listen to mine. His voice grew raucous, menacing, unpleasant. This is the second time tonight you've run afoul of my plans with your infernal diamonds and your piker hunts, and if trouble comes from this, look out for yourself. Five minutes ago, you said. Well, I wish he'd beamed you while he was at it. You've put an hour's work of mine to the bad. How long do you think this disturbance is going on before the police butt in? Take a look at that room, there. The two men took a step forward and shrank suddenly back. 
Bertie Rose's face had gone gray. He looked wildly at Billy Kane. "'My God!' whispered Red Vallon. "'I said something to you tonight about needing an object lesson, so that it would sink into you that when I said the limit I meant it,' said Billy Kane evenly. "'Well, you've got it now. Do you know who that man is?' Red Vallon shook his head. Bertie Rose was nervously plucking at a package of cigarette papers that he had drawn from his pocket. "'His name is Peters,' said Billy Kane, curtly. "'Peters was the butler at Ellsworth's. "'Jackson's pal. Get me? "'I found this.' The ruby from his vest pocket was lying now in the open palm of Billy Kane's hand. "'Do you understand what limit means now, Red? "'I found this. He wouldn't talk. "'And so?' Billy Kane shrugged his shoulders coolly, and his hand jerked forward, pointing to the disordered room. I hadn't found any more of them when you messed it up with your noise. Red Vallon circled his lips with his tongue. Let's get out of here, he said hoarsely. We'll have to now, thanks to you, snapped Billy Kane shortly. That's the only room that's been searched, and you've queered any chance of doing anything more now. He whirled impetuously on Red Vallon and shook his fist in the gangster's face. You see what you've done. Even if the police haven't got wise to the row, those people in the apartment downstairs will call them in the minute they get a chance. Yes, we've got to beat it. You and your diamonds are likely to give us a ride by the juice route up in that little armchair in Sing Sing. If your man gets away, it's a small matter now. Anybody that's caught here will have to stand for this. You go first, Bertie, and call the crowd off and scatter the minute you're outside the house. I don't want it published in the papers that I was with Peters in his expiring moments. Tumble, I can trust you too, because Billy Kane's smile was unhappy. If anything leaks, I'll know where it leaked from. Get the idea? Now beat it, Bertie. We'll give you a couple of minutes ahead of us. The man went out. Billy Kane walked coolly to the door, took the skeleton key from the inside of the lock, and fitted it again to the outside. "'Come on, Red,' he said. He locked the door and put the bunch of keys in his pocket. It was comparatively quiet in the house now. A door of one of the lower apartments opened cautiously, but closed instantly again as Billy Kane, with the gangster beside him, went down the stairs. In another moment they were out on the street and had turned the first corner. The gangster was muttering to himself— there's Bertie and me, but Savnak won't dare let a peep out of him, cause he was in on the diamond pinch himself. I'll get that guy with the mask yet if I swing for it. Spilled every blasted bean in the bag. That's me. His voice took on a sudden half-cringing, half-deferential tone. It wasn't my fault, Bundy, honest. You know that. You, you ain't sore, are you, Bundy? Billy Kane pushed his hat to the back of his head. The night air was cool, even crisp, but his hat band was ringing wet. He brushed his damp hair back from his forehead. It was strange that he should have murdered Peters after all. He answered gruffly. Forget it, said Billy Kane, alias the Rat. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen. Twenty-four Hours Later. From above, faintly through the flooring, came the tap 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 of the old Italian cobbler's hammer. Billy Kane, from his hands and knees, straightened up, easing his body from the discomfort of his cramped position. And as he listened, he toyed now with the steel jimmy commandeered from Whitey Jack, that was in his hand. He had been even more assiduous in his own tapping, at least for the last hour or more, than was the old fellow above there. The old fellow seemed to work all day, and all night. It was night now, or rather evening. If there was any sound heard from the street, it would be attributed to the old cobbler, of course, which was just as well. The murky light from the single incandescent across the room threw the sparse furnishings of the rat's den into uncouth shadows on the walls, and threw his own shadow into a grotesque, shapeless blotch upon the floor.
From the street level, down through the cellar-like stairway to this underground abode, seeping in through the closed door came the muffled roll of traffic, and a footstep now and then on the pavement like the echo of some sound that was detached, far distant. He resumed his work, tapping with infinite pains with the butt of his steel jimmy on board after board of the flooring. And now this board or that seemed to give back a more resonant sound than its fellows, and he tapped it again, and still again, only to shake his head finally and pass on to the next board. There were other secrets in this crime hole besides that ingenious door and its tunnel to the shed and lane behind. Secrets that she had plainly stated existed, and had as plainly stated were no secrets to her. Secrets that she wielded in such a manner as to complicate a situation that was already one of extreme peril and desperate enough. They were the rat's secrets. And for the moment he was the rat, and self-preservation made the possession of those secrets vitally essential to him. The net seemed to be drawing closer around him. At moments it seemed to be strangling him. He had built so heavily on Peters, and Peters was dead. And he, Billy Kane, was still the rat. It was difficult enough to carry out the role as it was. But if the rat should unexpectedly return, where was the rat? If he could glean a hint of when the rat might probably return, or of the rat's whereabouts, surely those secrets hidden here somewhere would answer, in a measure at least, those questions. Or, if not, then the fuller and more intimate knowledge they must give him of the rat would make his assumed role more secure, safer as long as he was forced to play it, since they would place in his hands the trumps that would enable him to preserve this character he had usurped as he came more and more into direct contact with that malignant crime trust of which the legitimate rat was obviously one of the leading spirits. And she that strange mysterious being whom he had come to call the woman in black, whose hatred, a hatred that was boundless, more bitter, more deliberate, more merciless than it seemed any human could hold for another. He had acquired, through this abhorrent proxy, that fate had thrust upon him. Surely these things hidden here, if he could but find them, must too, in a measure at least, explain what lay between her and the devil in human guise whose part he, Billy Kane, was compelled to play. He worked on, his ear attuned to the sound as the steel jimmy tapped the flooring, his mind feverishly, insistently active. He had counted on forcing the truth from Peters last night. Instead, he had found the old butler murdered, and had only managed to escape destruction himself at the hands of Red Vallon and the underworld through a spurious alibi that was in itself a ghastly thing. He, as the rat, stood now the self-confessed murderer of Peters. Yes. The net seemed to be drawing its strands so tightly about him sometimes that they strangled him, and strangled his soul, and made his courage falter. Peters was dead, murdered, and to have made the man talk he would have gone the limit himself. He had meant to wring the truth from Peters' lips at any cost, but a dead man couldn't talk. It was not warm in the room, nor was he overheated by his exertions. But Billy Kane, with the back of his hand, swept away a bead of moisture that had oozed out upon his forehead. Who was it who had murdered Peters, and why? His brain had wrestled with that problem since last night. There seemed to be but one answer, one solution. Peters' connection with the Ellsworth murder, the search that had been made in Peters' bedroom, and carried no further than that single room, indicating that what had been sought had been found, seemed to be proof positive that the author of the crime was at least conversant with the details of David Ellsworth's murder, if he were not, indeed, as seemed even more likely, one of those who had actually participated in that murder himself. And with this as a premise, the motive behind Peter's murder was apparently clear enough. Nearly fifteen thousand dollars and a fortune in rubies had been taken from the steel vault in the Ellsworth home. Peters might have been the temporary custodian, in whole or in part, of the proceeds of the robbery, or he might only have been in possession of his share. In either case it was enough to account for his having been double-crossed and murdered by one of his own accomplices, or else by someone sufficiently well informed about the Ellsworth murder 
to know that Peters had at least a tempting enough portion of the goods in his flat to make a visit there very much worth while. Billy Kane smiled a little grimly now, as moving forward he pushed the bed to one side in order to continue his examination of the flooring. That had been his solution, but, strangely enough, the newspapers for once had had no solution to offer. The known presence of so many men, when Red Vallon's gang had invaded the house, indicated quite clearly, the papers said, that it was the work of an organized band. But apart from that, they were frankly mystified. But because Peters had been the butler of David Ellsworth, and had been murdered just three nights after his master had been murdered, the morning papers had flung clamorous headlines across their front pages, and had filled their columns with every detail that had even the remotest bearing upon the affair. They, however, scarcely hinted at even a possible connection between the two crimes, for the simple reason that Peters had obviously been attacked by a gang, whereas in the case of David Ellsworth they knew that the old millionaire had been done to death by his private secretary, Billy Kane. He had read the papers, all of them, but out of the welter of words there had been only one thing that had possessed any value for him in the shape of information, and even that had been of a negative character. Some reporter had unearthed the fact that a stranger, whose description answered in a general way to Whitey Jack, had been seen loitering around the neighborhood of Peter's apartment during a good part of the previous day. The description was not accurate enough to identify Whitey Jack positively, but as Whitey Jack had been there, and there on his Billy Kane's instructions, he had immediately sent the man away that morning, and had told him to keep under cover until further orders. The steel jimmy tapped with persistent inquisitiveness along another board. Billy Kane's lips were tight now. Peter's death had seemed at first to have robbed him of all he had been building upon, and during the hours alone here in this den last night, facing what looked like the ruin of the final chance and hope of establishing his own innocence, of clearing his own name, of bringing to justice the wantons who had struck down old David Ellsworth, he had known those bitterest of hours where the will weakens and courage seems a useless thing and a mockery. But he had fought through those hours, and the morning had brought its reward. Peter's murder had broken the thread of evidence, but equally, it seemed, after all, it had knitted it together again. There was the man with the crutch. His lips relaxed a little in an ironical smile. The papers had overlooked the man with the crutch. It was Red Vallon who, all unconsciously, had joined together the broken thread. The gangster had come here to the den that noon. There had been a marked increase of deference in the man's attitude and manner, a sort of uh, unholy admiration, awe, respect, and fear. The man, hardened though he was himself, was still visibly affected by the fact that he stood in the presence of the rat, alias Bundy Morgan, who, as he believed, had coolly and imperturbably given gruesome evidence that, to gain his ends, he would neither hesitate nor stop at murder. Red Vallon had not forgotten, and was not likely to forget, his object lesson. Red Vallon had told his story furtively, leaning across the table, talking in a guarded whisper. He had got it straight enough from one of his own men, who the police in turn believed was one of their good stool pigeons. Shortly before the confusion incident to the exit of Red Vallon's men on the previous night, the exact hour not positively established, a man with a crutch, and carrying a small handbag, was known to have crept cautiously out of the apartment house where Peters had his flat. After that the man had disappeared. The police have uh, elected the cripple as the guy that waltzed off with the swag while the rest of the bunch made a noise to spare up his tracks. Red Vallon had said with a malicious grin. What's the matter with pushing a good thing along, Bundy? What's the matter with pushing out a few feelers and trying to spot this crutch gazabo? The Pippin's the one that put me wise, and the Pippin can make good nosing him out if anyone can. There had come upon Billy Kane an overwhelming surge of relief. More than anything else on earth that he had suddenly wanted at that moment was the man with the crutch. Yes, he had answered gruffly, afraid almost to trust his voice. Sure, Red Vallon had responded. I thought you'd be strong for it. Maybe it won't last long, 
"'cause the guy ought to be able to clear himself "'unless we can hitch it on to him for keeps. "'But there's nothing like heaving a little dirt "'in the eyes of the bulls "'and shooting them off on the wrong lay. "'It'll keep them guessing for a while, anyhow. "'You'll leave it to me, Bundy. "'I owe you something for queering your game last night, "'though I guess there wasn't any more of them rubies there "'beside the one you found. "'For the Pippin says the bulls didn't get anything.' and i owe you something for the lemon i handed you so far as falling down on spotting the ruby collection in any of the speakeasy joints but i won't fall down here you will leave it to me i'll pull some slick stuff this time the steel jimmy tapped on billy kane's face was set the man with the crutch was there any doubt but that the man with the crutch was not only peter's murderer but more vital still, one who in Peter's stead now embodied the clue to the hell-hatched plot that had cost David Ellsworth his life and had craftily woven the evidence of murder around him, Billy Kane, the man with the crutch. If only Red Vallon and the Pippin did not fail, then, the steel jimmy almost perfunctorily tapped over the same board again, and then Billy Kane suddenly bent lower, his ear close to the floor. He tapped once more. There was no doubt of it. The sound was unquestionably and distinctly hollow. He felt his pulse quicken. Off and on during the day he had covered almost the entire flooring of the room. He had started with the flooring. Only the flooring and the walls could contain any hidden recess. He had not touched the walls yet. And it might not be necessary now. He was examining the board critically. It was a short board, rough and uneven, about ten inches wide, that ran to the edge of the wall. There seemed to be no sign of any secret spring, either on the adjacent flooring or on the wall, nor did the board itself appear to be in any way loose or show any evidence of ever having been removed before. He frowned as he tapped it again and found that quite as unmistakably as before the hollow sound came back to him, and then, inserting the point of the jimmy in the joint at the end of the board, he gave the board a sharp wrench. It came away readily, but with it came a weary smile to Billy Kane's lips. Nothing. The underflooring had rotted away, which accounted for the hollow sound, and he was rewarded with nothing more than a hole bounded both in depth and width by the floor joists, which rested on the ground. Half angry half ironically amused, he reached forward to replace the board, and straightening up suddenly, listened. Someone was coming down the steps from the street. In an instant he had the board and bed back in place and the steel jimmy in his pocket, and now a cigarette was drooping languidly from his lips as in answer to a low knock he crossed the room and halted in front of the door. "'Who's there?' he demanded. "'It's the cadger,' a voice answered. Billy Kane opened the door. The cadger, unknown to him personally, was known to him by reputation. As one of those details vital to the preservation of the role he played, he had stored up in his memory during the past few days the name of every one connected with the crime trust that he had heard mentioned either by Red Vallon or others. The cadger was one of the lesser breed, a stagehand in the expressive vernacular of the underworld. The cadger, a shriveled, unkempt figure, his coat-collar turned up over a collarless shirt, an aggressively checkered peaked cap pulled down over his eyes, thrust an envelope unceremoniously into Billy Kane's hand. "'This is for you, Spondy,' he said hurriedly, already turning and making his way up the steps to the street again. "'See us later. I gotta go to Gannett's joint for his kit.' Billy Kane closed the door and locked it. He had not heard from Red Vallon since noon nothing in reference to the Pippin's quest for the man with the crutch. He tore the envelope open eagerly, the thought uppermost in his mind that this was a message from Red Vallon now, and then, staring at the sheet of paper which he had extracted from the envelope, he dropped, suddenly tight-lipped, into the chair by the table under the light. It wasn't from Red Vallon. It was a message like the one Red Vallon had showed him the night before, a message in the Crime Trust cipher. He turned instinctively in his chair, glancing toward the secret door at the rear of the room, as though he half expected to see it open, and see that slim little figure in black enter, as though he half expected to hear her cool, softly modulated voice that veiled, even as did the clear ripple in her laugh, menace and contempt. And then he laughed aloud in a short, hard way. A fool! 
was he well she had come in through that door before hadn't she when something was in the wind his eyes reverted to the sheet of paper he knew what it was the headquarters of the crime trust had been broken up and some of the leaders had even taken to cover since the night carlin had been arrested by the police but all the cogs in that machiavellian machinery had not stopped and plans formulated and set in motion in the past were still to be carried to their ultimate conclusions as they matured day by day there was not the slightest doubt but that this was one of the devil's schemes red vallon or was it the owner of those great dark steady eyes had said enough to make him understand that when temporarily scattered temporarily wary of the police some unhallowed managing director carried on their work and communicated with the different members of the gang by means of these cipher messages and now as he stared at the missive in his hand angry flush rose slowly to his cheeks and he half made as though to tear the paper into shreds god knew he had enough to do to keep his own life in his own body without this there was scarcely a moment of the day or night when he was not battling with all the wits he possessed to save himself from discovery from the police as billy kane from the underworld as a spurious rat and his brain was already sick and tormented beyond endurance with the struggle why then should he decipher this if he did he could not sit idly by and in the possession of the details of some proposed crime permit that crime to be enacted it was the moral obligation flung in his face again just as it had been on the night he had trapped carlin just as it had been last night when he had snatched vetter's diamonds from red vallon's maw and not through any threat of hers held over his head as she so thoroughly believed she wasn't here now was she he laid the paper down upon the table and smoothed it out tear it up <laughs> his short laugh was a jeer flung at himself certainly he could tear it up and he would know nothing about it except that he had shirked and turned his back like a coward upon the responsibility that was already his he could read the cipher if he wanted to he had seen her work one out the night before i thought i'd settle this sort of thing with myself before he muttered grimly and taking a pencil from his pocket he began to work out the cipher it took some time perhaps twenty minutes and then he was studying a second sheet of paper upon which he had written the decoded message the cadger and gannett will report to you at nine o'clock the ninth street house will be empty daler and servants out this evening secure sealed manila envelope in wall safe left of mantel in library combination two right eighteen one left eight one right twenty eight police on trail tomorrow the cadger's see you's later then was to be taken literally and not as he had supposed as simply a common and slang expression of adieu billy kane looked at his watch it was not quite eight o'clock there was an hour then before the cadger and this gannett another of the cadger's ilk would report here ready to follow his leadership in a burglarious raid Billy Kane stood up, and in a sort of mechanical and reassuring inventory, his hands felt over the outside of his pockets, over the skeleton keys they contained, the steel jimmy, the flashlight, the automatic, and the soft, slight bulge made by the neatly folded mask, and, too, over another bulge that was made by a certain chamois pocketbook. This latter brought a frown. He had not found a way yet to return Vetter's diamonds it wasn't so easy a thing to do when if the rat's hand showed in the matter it was certain destruction for the rat alias bundy morgan and for the moment alias billy kane but vetter and vetter's diamonds were extraneous things just now weren't they he extinguished the light crossed to the door unlocked it stepped out locked the door behind him made his way up the steps and started briskly off along the street he did not know what the contents of that manila envelope were nor who daler was nor the crime trust's motive he was supposed to know all that he knew only that there was some devil's scheme on foot that would be worthy of the crime trust in its scope and proportions and the crime trust did not interest itself in little things end of chapter sixteen
Chapter 17 of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The Man with the Crutch. Billy Kane smiled with grim irony as he walked rapidly down the block. She was not here tonight with her cool, contemptuous voice bidding him to do this thing. It was evident, therefore, that she was not quite as infallible as she apparently believed herself to be. For once, she was not acquainted beforehand with the Crime Trust's movements, it seemed. Perhaps it was because for once the Rat might not have had anything to do with originating the plan that was afoot tonight, for she had certainly always appeared to be thoroughly informed where the Rat was concerned. He shrugged his shoulders suddenly, dismissing her from his thoughts. He would better concentrate his mind on the work in hand. The secret lay in the manila envelope. That the envelope contained something of great value, or was of great value to someone, was obvious. To Daler, perhaps, since it was in Daler's carefully guarded possession. He shrugged his shoulders again. He could tell better about that in the course of another hour, when the envelope was in his pocket instead of Daler's safe. To balk this organized gang of super-criminals was sufficient for the moment. Once more his shoulders lifted. He perhaps was not even entitled to any great credit tonight in fulfilling his moral obligations. For once there appeared to be neither any great danger nor any great difficulty. The house was empty. It was not very far away. He had an hour in which to work undisturbed, and at the expiration of that time he should be back in his room and ready to set out with the cadger and gannet to rob an empty safe. If he, with the two men, then entered the house, and for their pains found the manila envelope already gone, certainly there could be no suspicion to rest upon him. Billy Kane had reached the Bowery now. He went in through the side entrance of a corner saloon. Here a minute's search in the telephone directory supplied him with the number of Daler's house on Ninth Street. After that he made his way over to Washington Square, crossed the square, gained the lower end of Fifth Avenue, practically deserted now at this hour, and a moment later, turning into Ninth Street, headed down the block in the direction of Sixth Avenue. It was one of the old aristocratic neighborhoods of New York, but changed now a great deal with the changing years. What had once been classed as mansions had in many cases been metamorphosed into lodging and boarding houses. But the mansions were still here, big, substantial, commodious stone dwellings, nor had the boarding-houses entirely ousted a certain unobtrusive type of wealth and means from their midst, and it argued not at all that this Daler, for instance, because he had his residence here, was not well-to-do, even exceedingly well-to-do. The street was quiet. Billy Kane located the house he sought. He passed by it, noting that it had a basement entrance, a flight of stone steps to the front door, that it was entirely in darkness, and returning, he mounted the steps quietly and without any attempt at concealment, found the outer vestibule door unlocked, opened it, after making pretense of ringing the doorbell for the benefit of anyone on the street who might have paid him any notice, stepped inside, and closed the door behind him. The inner door was locked. His skeleton keys came into play. Still, far from an adept in their use, he was several minutes at his work. Then he stepped forward into the hall of the house itself. His flashlight stabbed a lane of light through the darkness. The stairs leading to the upper floors of the house were ahead of him and on his right. On his left, opening off the hall, which seemed to run almost the depth of the house, were several doors, all of which were closed. The house was empty. The cipher message had assured him of that, but nevertheless he moved now with extreme caution to the first door on his left. He knew nothing of the plan of the house, but it was at least logical to assume that the library was on this floor, and the library was the objective of his search. He opened the door slightly, quietly, then drew sharply back, and stood tense and motionless, listening. There was a dull, faint glow of light in there, not as though the room itself were illuminated, but as though the light came from perhaps another room beyond. But there was no sound. A minute passed, and still he stood there, alert, his ears strained to catch the slightest noise, and then, reassured, he pushed the door wider open and stepped over the threshold. 
that a light might have been left burning, either intentionally or inadvertently, presented in itself nothing of the unusual, or— He was drawing his hand across his eyes like a man dazed from a blow. The light had gone in the winking of an eye. It was pitch black. He was still involuntarily staring, through darkness now, toward the front end of the room. The light had not come from that direction. It had come through a portiered archway in quite the opposite direction. But for the moment his mind was chaotic, out of control. The room was a drawing-room, a, a large, stately sort of a drawing-room, and there had been a huge pier-glass, gilt-framed, between the heavily curtained front windows. What he had seen could not have been a fantasy, nor due to disordered imagination. His eyes, the instant he had entered the room, had gone straight to that glass because it reflected the light from the other room. The surface of the glass had been blank as his eyes had first fallen upon it, and then, like a flash, enduring for but the minutest fraction of a second, the reflection of a figure, a man's figure, a man's figure with a crutch, had swept across it, and the light in the other room had gone out. And now Billy Kane acted quickly. The time that he had stood there, inert, mentally stunned, had been but a matter of seconds, exaggerated into seemingly interminable, measureless hours. Swiftly, silently, he reached the archway, and, sheltering himself behind the folds of the portiers, but in a position to command the other room with his automatic, which he had whipped from his pocket, he stood still and listened. There was only the quick, fierce pounding in his own eardrums, in tempo with the mad race of blood through his veins. The man with the crutch. How or why the man came to be here, or what the other had to do with what was afoot tonight, scarcely entered his mind. It did not matter. Nothing mattered, save to get the man with the crutch. Everything else paled into insignificance. It was the same man that had murdered Peters. There would not be two men with crutches who prowled stealthily at night in other people's houses. But that it was Peters' murderer was significant now only because it identified the man as one who held the secret of David Ellsworth's murder. The man who, if he, Billy Kane, could but get to grips with him, would tell what he knew to the last word, or one or the other of them would never leave this house alive. It was the man who could end this hideous masquerade that he, Billy Kane, was forced to assume. The man who could clear his name of the foul blot that had cost him friends, the companionship of honest men, and that was like at any instant to cost him his life. There was no sound. And then Billy Kane's voice rang suddenly, imperatively, through the silence. Hands up! His flashlight bored through the darkness, circling the room in front of him. The room, it was the library, beyond doubt, was empty. His jaws locked. He had taken a chance. It had failed. But now his glance fell upon the door, diagonally across the library from him, that from its position obviously opened on the hall. He could have sworn that the doors opening on the hall were all closed when he had entered the house. This one was ajar now. He crossed the library with a bound, swung the door wide, and peered out into the hall. He could see nothing. But now, from somewhere below, he caught a sound as of a boot heel thudding on a bare floor, or perhaps the tap of a crutch. Along at the rear of the hall his flashlight focused on the head of a basement stairway. He ran for this now, and then, with more caution, wary of offering himself as a target for a shot that would put an end to any hope of getting within reach of the other, his flashlight out, he began to pick his way downstairs. Halfway down, he caught another sound. From the front of the house, softly and cautiously, though it was done, there came the unmistakable opening and closing of the basement door. Billy Kane took the remaining steps in a leap and his flashlight pointing the way dashed along the hallway below. He reached the door and pulled at it. Then, with an angry, muttered exclamation, he stood there for an instant hesitant. The man had managed to lock the door behind him. Mechanically, his hand went toward his pocket for his skeleton keys, but stopped halfway as, turning suddenly, he raced back upstairs. It would take too long to try out key after key. There was a better way. There was the front door. He had left that unlocked when he came in. He gained this now, jerked it open, lunged through the little vestibule, snatched at the knob of the outer door, and wrenched at it viciously like a madman in mingled rage and chagrin. It was locked! It had not been locked, 
even when he had come in. Calmer in an instant, he took his keys from his pocket and worked with feverish haste at the lock. It would possibly take less time to run into the drawing-room, get a window open, and jump to the ground, but he did not dare to do that. He had to come back here with the cadger and Gannett in a little while, and he dared not risk anything that would imperil his role in the eyes of the underworld. Even a number of people coming and going from the house, if they acted naturally, entering by the door as though they had a right to enter, would never attract the slightest notice from either neighbors or passers-by. That was what doors were for. But a man leaping out through one of the front windows would invite certain attention, suspicion, and instant investigation. Another key. Would he never get one that fit? This wasn't the door he had opened before. A minute, perhaps two, perhaps even three, must have gone by. God, how clumsy his fingers were. The man must have had an amazing agility for a cripple, and the craft and cunning of a devil to come up here instantly on leaving the basement and lock this door. Would he never get the— Yes, he had it now. He swung the door open, and from the top step his glance swept the street in both directions, and then there came a sort of bitter philosophical acceptance of a situation that he had already more than half expected. The man with the crutch had had too much time. There was no sign of him now. But there was still a chance. Billy Kane closed the door behind him, went quietly down the steps to the pavement. There was still the inviolability of the house to be preserved walked along without undue haste until far enough away to preclude the chance of any connection being established between himself and the house he had just left, and then broke into a run. There was still a chance. But it was a slim one. He knew that. The man must have gone toward either Sixth Avenue or Fifth Avenue. It was more likely Sixth Avenue. There would be more people there, more traffic, more opportunity to lose himself. It was the logical thing to do. Lower Fifth Avenue at night was almost as deserted as a tomb. The man could have been seen there blocks away. Perhaps fifteen minutes passed. At the expiration of that period, Billy Kane returned to the Daler residence, and for the second time that night coolly and quite casually mounted the steps and again entered the house. His search had been futile. He had circuited the blocks in the neighborhood and hunted up and down the adjacent section of Sixth Avenue, and the more he had hunted, the more he had realized the futility of what he was doing, though at that he had even, as a last hope, returned to Fifth Avenue. And now he was back in the house again, and quite conscious that this, too, was likely now to prove as barren of results as his search had been. The man had got away and with the man in all likelihood had gone to the manila envelope from the wall safe in the library. What else had the other been in the library for? Billy Kane shrugged his shoulders as, using his flashlight again, he stepped from the hall into the drawing-room, and from there through the archway into the library. There was the one possibility that he had come upon the man with the crutch and interrupted the other in his work before the envelope had been secured. That was the one possibility that remained and that was the one possibility that had prompted him to come back. He stood for a moment now beside the table that occupied the center of the room, his flashlight creeping in a low, inquisitive circle around the walls, and now the round white ray arrested held on the mantel opposite the archway. On either side of the mantel, shoulder high and projecting out a little from the wall, were what appeared to be bric-a-brac or perhaps liquor cupboards with leaded glass doors. Wall safe left of mantle, the message had said. He smiled a little grimly in appreciation and understanding as he moved over and halted before the left-hand cupboard. It was a rather neat ambush for a wall safe, this idea of Daler's, eh, whoever Daler might be. The leaded glass door opened readily. The ray of the flashlight flooded the interior. Billy Kane's smile was gone. He was quite sure now that he was too late. The cupboard was used for liqueurs, but the liqueur in turn were evidently used for the purpose of veiling the little nickel dial of a safe that protruded from the wall at the rear of the cupboard, for the bottles were all pushed now to one side, and the dial, with a sort of diabolical mockery it seemed, winked back reflected rays from the glare of the flashlight. It was blatantly apparent now that this had been the object of the other's visit to the house, and it was almost as equally apparent that the man had got what he had come for. 
and yet two right eighteen one left almost perfunctorily muttering the combination billy kane had reached in and was twirling the knob of the dial eight one right twenty-eight the little steel door swung noiselessly open billy kane stared into the miniature safe bewildered and then he laughed a little <laughs> a minute before and he would not have given a penny for his chances the other had got only so far as to move the bottles to one side he had beaten the man with the crutch by the very narrow margin of time it would have taken to manipulate the combination perhaps though the other hadn't known the combination and was just about to set to work to force the safe well it didn't matter the manila envelope lay there sealed intact he took the envelope from the safe closed the door and locked it and whirled suddenly around from his position in front of the mantel his flashlight jerked upward played full upon the archway a cool disdainful laugh ripples low through the room a woman's laugh billy kane did not move the chill that had clutched at his heart, the fear of discovery, was gone almost as quickly as it had come. He had nothing to dread on that score from the woman in black. And it was not the first time she had come upon him unexpectedly. And it was she who stood there now, and she still stood full in the glare of his flashlight, a bewitching, entrancing, mysterious little figure, whose great dark eyes were fixed on him, half in a deliberate speculative way, and half in a sort of contemptuous mockery. It was she who broke the silence. I wonder if it's true, Bundy, she said softly. He felt the blood surge hot into his cheeks. He knew a sudden bitter rebellion at the contempt in those steady eyes, the same bitter rebellion he had known last night in her presence, a rebellion against the fate that caused him, through reason of being the counterpart of some incarnate fiend, to stand in her eyes as that actual fiend himself, as the one who in some way had done her or hers irreparable wrong, as the embodiment of all that was loathsome and hideous to her. He was the rat to her, as to everybody else. The envelope crackled in his fingers as he clenched his hand. Would he always have to play the rat to her? What would that perfect, oval face, beautiful even now in its fearless contempt, look like in softer mood? Is what true? he demanded gruffly. She came toward him across the room. That you are really playing the game, she said slowly. It's not much credit to you, of course, since you are doing it through fear, but still... She shrugged her shoulders daintily as she stood beside him. Do you know, Bundy that lately you seem to have changed somehow. I do not know just how, but I cannot account for it. It puzzles me. Forget it, growled Billy Kane, alias the Rat. Well, I don't know what game you're talking about either. Oh, yes, you do, she answered. I told you that I would hold you responsible for any crime committed by your accomplices that it lay within your power to circumvent. That was the chance I gave you, and you seem to be taking it. I thought I would test you out tonight, when you might imagine that I was ignorant of what was going on, and that you might therefore count on escaping the consequences as far as I was concerned. You were to come here with the cadger and Gannett at nine o'clock to rob that safe. You are here alone long before that hour, and you have robbed the safe. I presume, at least I am going to give you credit for it, that it is because you are playing the game I referred to and are checkmating your partners and preventing the crime from being carried any further there was silence for a moment i think you had better put out that flashlight she said he must play the rat his soul jeered at him ironically he snapped off the light how did you get wise to this he flung out about tonight why it was one of your own pet schemes wasn't it bundy all worked out quite a while ago that's how i knew well, am I right about the reason for your being here alone? And if so, how did you propose to square yourself with uh, your cronies of the underworld? By coming back here with the cadger and Gannon, of course, he replied curtly, and letting them fall for the idea that someone had beaten us all to it. Yes, she said calmly. Well, I quite approve, Bundy, and I'll take that envelope now, please. You won't have any further use for it, and I'll attend to the rest of this affair. 
He handed her the envelope. He asked nothing better than that she should assume any further responsibility that might be connected with its contents. As far as he was concerned, there were matters of far greater moment now. There was the man with the crutch, and that was a matter in which he had very cogent reasons for desiring to play a lone hand. His lips tightened. It was fairly evident that she had not been in the house the first time he had entered, but he wanted to be sure. "'When did you get in here?' he snapped. "'Followed me, I suppose.' "'About five minutes ago,' she said quietly. "'And you left the door unlocked, though I had a key. "'No, I didn't follow you. Why should I? "'I knew that you would be here at nine o'clock anyway, "'and I simply came a little ahead of time. "'I really hoped, you see, that uh, you would do the same, "'and for more reasons than the one I have just mentioned. "'What do you mean?' he grunted. "'I haven't seen you since last night, you know.' she said deliberately. What about the diamonds that were stolen from Vetter? I've got them, he answered shortly. Vetter hasn't. There was a cold, unpleasant inflection in her voice. Well, what do you expect? He forced a raucous note into his voice. He was not sure that it sounded genuine. It was not easy to play the rat with her. Think it over. It's not so soft a job to get them back to him without leaving a trail behind that might trip me up, see? She appeared to consider this for a moment. "'That is true,' she said at last. "'Well, have you got them here?' "'Yes.' He reached into his pocket and took out the chamois pocketbook. He laughed brusquely as he held it out to her. <laughs> "'If you can handle that envelope, maybe you can handle the sparklers, too.' "'I can, and I will,' she said simply as she took the pocketbook from him. "'That's only fair.' I told you once I would put no difficulties in the way of your keeping yourself solid, if you could, with your fellow yeggs, and that applies equally to tonight. You may bring the cadger back here. You will find the house empty. Thanks, he said grimly. I'll move along, then. I've got just about enough time left. And would you mind locking the front door when you go out? I'd like the cadger to get all the run that's coming to him for his money. He stepped forward to pass her, but she laid a detaining hand on his arm. Wait, she said tersely. I agreed to look after this envelope. But even so, you are not through yet tonight, Bundy. I know where Mr. Daler is this evening, and I'm going to bring him back here to his own house myself. But I will give you time first to play out your little farce with your two thugs and send them about their business. Say, ten o'clock. Mr. Daler and myself will be here at that time. And so will you. Will I? inquired Billy Kane insolently. What's the lay? A trap? No, an experiment, she said evenly. I would like to find out if there is really anything human, if there is a shred of decency left in you. I want you to see your crime for once from your victim's standpoint. It may help you, if you are human, to keep on playing the game. And that will help you. If you can't keep out of the clutches of the underworld to keep out of the electric chair at Sing Sing. You quite understand, Bundy? At ten o'clock. And I should not even mind if you are found here in this room, in the dark, when Mr. Daler and myself enter the house. At ten o'clock. And now I think you had better hurry, Bundy. There was a twisted smile on Billy Kane's lips. He was the rat, and the rat would be here, or anywhere else at ten o'clock, if she said so. There was no comment to make. The rat had no choice. All right, he said gruffly, and moved past her to the door and out to the hall, and a moment later, reaching the street, he swung into a hurried stride, heading back for the rat's den. End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen Mirrored Years. It was quite dark here in Daler's library, yet he had sat so long in this chair that his eyes seemed to have accommodated themselves to the darkness, and it seemed as though he could distinguish every object in the room. Surely, interminably, as the minutes dragged themselves out, the quarter-hour that had stood between ten o'clock and the time he had sent the cadger and Gannett away was up now. 
His flashlight winked through the blackness, played on the dial of his watch, and the blackness fell again. It still lacked five minutes of the hour. Strange how his mind worked. There was no speculation as to precisely why she had demanded his presence here. There was only intolerant, angry impatience because she had done so. If it had not been for her, he could have been making vital use of every one of these minutes. There was nothing else to have hindered him. It had been almost childishly easy to pull the wool over Gannett's and Cadger's eyes. He had let the Cadger and Gannett take all the initiative, apparently. The two men had forced the basement door, and then going upstairs had opened the front door for him, which he, strolling down the street a few minutes later, had entered as casually as he had already done before on two occasions that night. After that, the three of them clustered around the mantel, the cadger manipulating the dial of the safe while Gannett held the flashlight, had made the discovery in common that the safe had been already looted. He had joined in the dismay, chagrin, and fury of his companions. He had joined in the frantic search of desks and drawers, which he had inaugurated, and which he had permitted to endure for a full half-hour. At the expiration of that time he had coded a terse cipher report, and had handed it to the cadger and Gannett for delivery. They were to leave the house, himself last, a few minutes apart in order to avoid arousing any attention, and the cadger and Gannett, obediently and unsuspiciously, had gone. And he had remained. It had been very simple, and there remained no trace of the search that had been made. His eyes now, so strangely accustomed to the darkness, reassured him on that score. He had warned the men not to leave any traces behind them. He stirred uneasily in his chair. All this had been essential, necessary, vital, in order to preserve his role of the rat from suspicion and himself from subsequent and quick disaster at the hands of the underworld. But the minutes that were slipping away from him now, as he sat here impotent, were priceless. Red Vallon and the Pippin at any moment might run the man with the crutch to earth, and his hands were tied. He had no concern with the effect that the loss of the envelope might have had on this Daler. He was utterly indifferent to either the contents of that envelope or Daler's connection with it. It seemed to plumb the very depths of irony that she had appeared to labor under the impression she might somehow, in this way, arouse his better nature and touch some softer human chord within him. He was concerned more with the connection between that envelope and the man with the crutch, and very much more with the contents of that handbag the man with the crutch had carried away from Peter's flat the night before, and still more again with the man with the crutch himself. The man had tricked him here tonight, slipped through his fingers this time, but— the front door was being opened. Billy Kane stood up, shrugging his shoulders. He was in a truculent mood now, impatient to be gone, prompted even now to go, restrained only by the cooler counsel of common sense. She had the whip hand over him. A word from her, and he would be in exactly the same case, as if he had failed in the play he had just made with the cadger and Gannett. Voices reached him, hers quiet and controlled a man's, gruff, irritated, sharply antagonistic. And then the door from the hall opened and the lights in the library went on, Billy Kane's eyes passing swiftly over the trim little figure in black across the room, met and held those of a man who, startled now, stepped hastily back, only to discover that his companion had quietly and swiftly closed the door behind him. The man's lips were suddenly compressed and hard, though the color had ebbed a little from his face. "'Please sit down over there at the table, Mr. Dela,' she requested softly. "'No!' examined the man angrily. "'I'll do nothing of the kind. What's the meaning of this? You inveigled me back here by hinting at some kind of story, and you run me in my own house into the presence of a thug.' She shook her head. "'It is true that I asked this gentleman.' She hesitated over the choice of the word, while her eyes, in a sort of mocking humor, inventoried Billy Kane's none too reputable appearance and attire. To come here. But it is equally true that I have some kind of a story that I think will interest you. Bundy, you might try and persuade Mr. Daly to sit down. 
A grim smile came to Billy Kane's lips. He was a pawn, too, like this Daler, a pawn to be moved about at will by this outrageously courageous, imperturbable, and, yes, in spite of his own irritation, adorable little personage. He turned his attention now to Daler. The other could have been no more than forty-five, yet his hair was not merely prematurely gray, it was white, as a very old man's is white. His face, clean-shaven, was kindly, though drawn now in tense lines about the lips and forehead. "'Sit down,' Billy Kane ordered curtly. He was fingering his automatic, playing up to the cue she had given him. Daler hesitated, and then abruptly stepped forward and flung himself into a chair at the table, his back to the mantel. "'Well,' he challenged, "'you got me out of my cab on the pretext of having something to say about a man named Keats, whom I once knew. But from the look of things it appears to be much more likely that with my own house affording you protection I am to be coolly robbed of my watch, money, and such other valuables as you may be able to lay your hands on.' The slim little figure had slipped gracefully into a chair, facing Daler on the opposite side of the table. She smiled curiously. "'But at least I will keep my promise first and tell you about this Keats,' she said. "'Buck Keats, wasn't it, Mr. Daler? "'And as your servants may be back in another half hour or so, "'we won't waste any time in getting to the story. "'It goes back about twenty years. "'At that time you were in the Yukon, "'and pretty well away from civilization, "'and you had been prospecting all summer with your partner, "'a man quite a little older than you were, "'a man named Lington joe lington square joe they called him in that country and you ought to know why he was a big man in his body and in his soul a god's nobleman wasn't he mr daler daler was leaning forward staring at her in a strange puzzled way how do you know all this he demanded sharply she shook her head again i may not be quite accurate in the little details she went on you will overlook that you and Lenton delayed your return to Dawson too long that fall. You were caught in bad weather. Your provisions ran low. Lenton met with a nasty accident with an axe. In reaching up above his head to cut some branches for fuel, the axe in some way glanced off and inflicted a very serious and a very ugly wound in his shoulder and chest. Things went from bad to worse. For days Lenton could do nothing but lie in his blood-soaked bunk. Provisions ran still lower. The winter was settling down hard. You had already delayed too long, and now Lenton couldn't go. And yet you woke up one morning to find his bunk empty. She paused. Billy Kane's eyes, as he stood beside the table, passed from one to the other. Her small gloved hand, resting on the arm of her chair, had closed tightly. And into Daler's face, grown haggard now, had come the look of a dumb beast in hurt. On a sheet of paper, on the table... Her voice was lower now. Lainton had left a message for you, the kind a brave man would leave, explaining it all, and bidding you take the one chance you had and go without him. And piled on the table beside the sheet of paper was his money, quite a few hundred dollars. You went to the door of the shack, and you followed the tracks in the snow. And you found him, and you found his revolver beside him. You were already weak and half delirious yourself for lack of food, and I think this crazed you and unhinged your mind. You buried him in the snow and picked up the revolver and put it in your pocket. You took the paper and the money and what food there was, and you ran, like the madman you then were, away from the shack. I do not know how long you wandered, nor how you existed, nor the number of miles you put between yourself and the man who had given his life for you. But eventually you were found by a trapper, and the trapper's name was Keats, Buck Keats, a man with a very unsavory record. You spent some time with Keats. You recovered your physical health, but your mind remained affected. What had taken place was temporarily a blank to you. Keats robbed you of Lainton's money and most of your own, and he stole that paper which later on was to mean so much to you. He preferred, if anything were ever known, that you and not he should be credited with having stolen Lainton's money, and he further helped out that suggestion by getting you, after some months, out of the country, by having you, in a word, disappear. I imagine you were like a child in his hands. I am sure you do not even know how you got there. 
but the spring found you quite normal in all respects save a broken memory working at anything you could get to do in mexico and living there under the name of daler your proper name is forbes john forbes isn't it daler's head was forward on the table and buried in his hands and billy kane meeting her glance read through a sudden mist in the brown eyes a bitter condemnation of himself that he did not quite fully understand he was not the rat was he he was only playing the rat in a fight for his life and to win back a name of his own how should he understand i am taking too long she said hurriedly your awakening came then you read in a paper of the discovery of a brutal and revolting crime in the yukon the murder of joe lanton the snow had melted and a trooper of the royal northwest mounted police had found the body if ever there was a prima facie case of murder it was there the axe wound presupposing a quarrel the blood-soaked bunk the final wound from a revolver shot the absence of any weapon left in the possession of the dead man the fact that he had apparently been stripped of his money and most damning of all that you had disappeared it all came back to you in a flash then and like the last straw adding to this array of evidence already against you you realized that you were now living under an assumed name the letter written and signed by Lainton that would have saved you was gone you naturally did not know that it had been stolen from you you believed that you had lost it it would take a very brave man and a man that was very sure of himself indeed to judge you for what you did then without that paper you an innocent man were already as good as hanged if you gave yourself up you continued to live on as daler Twenty years went by. You prospered. You lived in all quarters of the globe. No breath of suspicion ever associated John Daler with John Forbes. But you knew, because you knew the record of the Royal Northwest Mounted, that the men who never sleep had not forgotten the case nor given over the search, and that they never would. But at last, after a long lapse of years, you felt yourself secure, and finally, a few years ago, you came here and settled in New York. Daler's head came up. He passed his hand across his eyes. How do you know all these things? He asked again. Does it matter? She answered. They are true, aren't they? Yes, they are true. His voice was scarcely audible. It was Keats who found you, not the Royal Northwest Mounted, she continued. Keats had long ago left the Yukon and had settled in Chicago a drunkard he was an old man now and down and out living from hand to mouth i do not know how he found you i only know that after all these years he decided to make restitution though counting no doubt on you giving him some money in return for the letter however be that as it may two days ago a man brought you a sealed envelope which he said a man named keats who had just died in chicago had confessed as he was dying to having stolen from you and that Keats, as a last request, had asked that it be given back to you. You opened the envelope and found that it contained Ladenton's letter. With this in your possession at last, you are absolutely secure, even in the very improbable event of anything ever being done by the police. Why then, after twenty years, should you voluntarily open the case and disrupt the associations you had formed, and your life as long as you had moulded it in all this time? At any event, you would consider long and carefully before taking so vital and momentous a step i do not know what your final decision was or even if you have come to one yet but pending such a decision you she motioned suddenly across the table but first will you please open the table drawer in front of you mr dela he obeyed her a sort of slow wonder in his movements the drawer open disclosed among other supplies of stationery a pile of long manila envelopes she motioned again this time to the envelopes you sealed the letter up again in one of those envelopes and put it away and that brings us to tonight i would like to have you show that letter to she indicated billy kane with a curt nod of her head that this man here for an instant daler did not move then he stiffened back in his chair his eyes narrowed i begin to see his jaws snapped hard together so that's what you are after the you propose to steal that paper from me and then blackmail me with it afterwards 
It is the letter that you want. And perhaps you will get it for us? she suggested softly. There was a grim sort of finality in Dayler's short, unpleasant laugh. <laughs> no, he said. Well, then, she still spoke softly. Suppose I were to tell you that the men who never sleep have been advised that Daler and John Forbes are one, and that they are travelling down from the Canadian West now, and that tomorrow you will be arrested, and that the letter is already gone. Gone? It came in a startled cry. Daler half rose from his chair, but dropped back again coolly, a sarcastic smile suddenly on his lips. Clever, he said ironically. Quite a pretty little ruse to get me to indicate the whereabouts of that paper. <laughs> Perhaps you will try something else now. Bundy, she turned calmly to Billy Kane, open the door of that little cupboard on the left of the mantel. Billy Kane stepped across the room in a sort of mechanical obedience and opened the leaded glass door, just as Daler, his self-assurance shaken now, jumped from his chair and rushed to the mantel. Perhaps, her voice came calmly again from the table, Mr. Daler prefers to look for himself after all, Bundy. The man seemed to be fighting desperately for a grip upon himself, and again his jaws snapped hard together. No, he cried. It's another trick to get the combination of that safe, to get me to open it. Do you think I'm a fool to let that paper go now, even at the cost of my life, after you have so kindly warned me that I am to be arrested tomorrow? You would have done better not to have talked quite so much. Open the safe, Bundy, she instructed evenly. Watch him, Mr. Daler, and satisfy yourself. The dial whirled deftly, swiftly under Billy Kane's fingers. The steel door swung open. Gone! My God, it's gone! Daler's cry now was broken, almost inarticulate. His head half buried in the cupboard, he was staring into the empty safe. And then he reeled back to the table, and stood there clawing at its edge, gray to the lips, looking from one to the other. I have not quite finished my story, she said quietly. It is quite true that Keats is dead, but he did not die two or three days ago. He has been dead well over a month. Nor did he die from natural causes. He was murdered. There is a gigantic crime ring in this country, whose headquarters are here in New York, that is as implacable and heinous as it is far-spread and powerful. Keats, far under the influence of liquor in a low dive one night, and in maudlin self-admiration at the idea of making restitution to you, became drunkenly confidential, and his confidant, as it appeared, was an old broken-down yegg of about his own age, too old for active work at his sordid trade, a pensioner, a hanger-on, as it were, of the crime ring, who made himself as valuable as he could in any way that he could. He reported the story. Keats was promptly murdered, not so much for the sake of the paper, for that could easily have been taken from him without resorting to murder, but that there should be no Keats, with his change of heart, ready to take the witness stand in your behalf, and therefore render the paper of no value to them at all. The crime ring did not, however, act with the same haste as far as you were concerned. That is not their way. They watched you. They became thoroughly conversant, intimately acquainted with you and your house and your mode of living. It was necessary that they should do so before the next move could be decided upon. It was essential that you should know that the document was still in existence, and it was equally essential that you should know Keats was dead, and would therefore never be able to help you with his testimony. The actual delivery of the document into your hands was the really clever and finished play to make, for it not only accomplished those ends naturally, simply, and without possibility of alarming you, but your temporary possession of the letter would also psychologically enhance its value in your eyes and make the shock of its subsequent loss all the greater. And you were all the more generous, but unless they could be sure of recovering it, if, for instance, you had a safe deposit vault where you would likely place it, the plan would not do at all, and some other must be devised. They satisfied themselves on that score, however, and the discovery of that wall safe, and incidentally its combination, made it as certain as anything is humanly certain that they would know where to find the letter again when they wanted it. And finally there was the police, the men of the Royal Northwest Mounted, to be put upon your trail. 
it was only when you stood facing arrest for murder and only when that paper was all that stood between you and the hangman's noose that it was worth well perhaps will you say what it is worth that is the situation to-night mr dayler the man was rocking on his feet still clawing at the edge of the table for support he seemed to have lost all control blackmail he said through dry twitching lips and without any comeback she shrugged her shoulders you are rated at a quarter of a million what will you give for that paper Daylor did not answer at once. He reached out behind him, felt for the arm of his chair, and sat down heavily. He spoke at last, brushing his hand nervously across his forehead. I, uh, I'll give ten thousand dollars, he said hoarsely. You do not place a very complimentary value on your life, she said evenly. Twenty. His hand still nervously brushed at his forehead. Uh, Twenty-five. Her laugh rippled through the room. It was low and coolly disdainful, but it seemed to Billy Kane, standing by the mantel, tight-lipped, watching the scene, that it held, too, a queer, underlying, tremulous note. Daylor wet his lips. Thirty-five. That paper is the only thing that will save you, she explained monotonously. Is money any good to you, unless you live? It was Daylor who laughed now, but it was hysterically. His hands would not remain still. He had let his head alone now, and instead kept laying his hands on the table in front of him by turns opening and clenching them, and they left damp prints on the top of the table. Fifty. I'll make it fifty thousand dollars, he whispered. She shook her head. My God! It was a helpless cry. Daylor stretched out his arms imploringly. You don't understand. It's not easy for me to get even that amount. I'm not worth what you think I am. I've, 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 I've gone the limit. Her voice was still monotonous. Are you sure? She asked. Give me, give me time, and, and I might make it a little more. There was no doubt of the agonized sincerity in the man's voice. Perhaps uh, sixty. No, she said. She was on her feet now, her voice breaking a little. I want more than that. What it will perhaps be harder for you to give than sixty thousand dollars. I want your forgiveness for what i have just made you suffer for this scene here i had reasons reasons that i believe justified me she glanced at billy kane i do not think you would understand and i am afraid you would not see the justification in them even if i tried to explain and so she had drawn the manila envelope from the bodice of her dress and was holding it out to him i can only ask you to forgive me he took the envelope wonderingly rising slowly to his feet. He was like a man dazed. Stupefaction, incredulity, a mighty relief mingled their expressions in his face. He turned the envelope over and over, and then, opening it, extracted a folded piece of paper from within. And then, for the second time, his laugh rang through the room. But now it was a laugh like the laugh of a man who was insane, high-pitched, and sustained. <laughs> Uh, go on he cried wildly go on with your hellish tricks what's next billy kane had involuntarily stepped closer to the table he drew in his breath sharply now in an amazed startled way daylor was holding a blank piece of paper in his hands and she too was leaning tensely forward he glanced at her she turned her head toward him and out of a face that was as white as death her dark eyes burned full of fury and bitter condemnation as they fixed upon him. I see it now. Her lips were quivering with passion. She steadied her voice with an obvious effort. I gave you credit for too much. I caught you at your work just a second too late. I thought you were taking an envelope out of the safe words you were attempting to put one in. The one you took out was already in your pocket. You were checkmating your miserable accomplices unquestionably. But it was for your own ends. You were playing the traitor to them and to me at the same time. You meant with your cold-blooded cunning to use that paper against Mr. Taylor for your own private gain. You lied to me. It wasn't an empty safe to which you meant to introduce the cadger at Gannett. There was a little more finesse. It clouded the issue a little more to put a dummy envelope there. And it was so easy. Just one of those envelopes taken from the drawer there and a piece of paper slipped inside. She paused an instant, surveying him with merciless eyes. 
I hardly suppose that you would be fool enough not to have already put it in a safer place than your pocket. But if you still have it there, hand it over. Billy Kane did not move. Somehow he was not paying undivided attention to her. It was the man with the crutch who seemed to be standing there in her place, grinning at him, only he could not see the man's face. And then, with a mental jerk, he pulled himself together. He could not tell her that he had almost caught someone else in the act of stealing the paper, but that the someone else had got away. It would sound ridiculous. She would laugh in his face. He could not tell her that, like a thunderbolt falling upon him, there had just come the realization that the man with the crutch had stolen the paper after all. He could not explain the man with the crutch, Peter's murder, a hundred other things, so that she would believe him without telling her that he was Billy Kane, and he could not tell her that he was Billy Kane. The old, hard, ironical, mirthless smile came to his lips. He was the rat. "'Maybe you'd like to search me,' he snarled insolently. She turned to Daler. The man had sunk into his chair again and was smiling now, but in a horribly apathetic sort of way. "'Mr. Dana, she said quietly, "'it does not matter in the least if he has got rid of it for the moment. I promise you that paper will be in your possession again by tomorrow morning.' She swung on Billy Kane and pointed to the door. "'I think you heard what I said, Bundy.' Her voice was ominously low now, strained with menace. I will give you until tomorrow morning to produce that paper. The alternative is the electric chair. She was still pointing to the door. He shrugged his shoulders. What was the use? The net was closing tightly about him, tighter than ever before, and the strands now were like some devil's tentacles that would not let go. He swung on his heel abruptly, and without a word left the room. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 A Hole in the Wall Once in the street, Billy Kane started hurriedly in the direction of the Bowery. He hastened on, his mind in a state of chaotic turmoil. Presently he turned into the cross street a block away from the rat's den. He had until morning. It was thoughtful of her to have given him that much time. The man with the crutch had the paper, of course. Red Vallon and the Pippin had had since noon to find the man. If the man were not found by morning, the role of the rat would be at an end. There was something damnably ironical in that. He had wanted the role of the rat to end, and now he didn't want it to end on account of this man with the crutch who was disastrously likely to bring that end about. He needed the role now more than ever in order to use it against the man with the crutch, because the other held the knowledge that would enable him, Billy Kane, to cast off the role forever. Yet if he didn't find the man, and even before morning... The role, and quite as certainly forever, would be cast off for him. He swept his hand across his eyes. His brain seemed to be working in some silly sing-song cycle, and yet it was quite logical. And then his shoulders squared. For the night, at least, he was still the rat, and the underworld was at the rat's beck and call. If Red Vallon and the Pippin could not find the man with the crutch, he would unleash the underworld to help them pick up the scent. First, however, he must get in touch with Red Vallon, but that should not be difficult, for Red Vallon, whether he had had any success or not, was certain to make a report before the night was very much older, and— Billy Kane halted suddenly, and turned around as a low voice hailed him. A man was hurrying along behind him. He smiled grimly. A little luck, at least, seemed to be breaking for him at the start. Here was Red Vallon now. Billy Kane, in apparent indifference, started on again in the direction of the den. "'Hello,' he said gruffly, as the gangster caught up with him and fell into step alongside. Red Vallon chuckled low. "'We got him,' he said. There was hoarse elation in the gangster's voice. A fierce uplift swept in an almost overmastering surge upon Billy Kane. His answer, however, was little more than a grunt of approval. "'You have, huh?' he said. 
"'You bet your life!' exclaimed the gangster jubilantly. "'You know Marlott's saloon? "'Well, the guy lives next door in that old moth-eaten shack. "'Some place. "'The police have been leery of it for a long while. "'There's mostly a bunch of slick fingers hang out there, get me? "'He's got the back room, used to be a kitchen, I guess. "'He's a smooth one, all right. "'He's got a private entrance of his own "'when he doesn't want to go in or out by the front.' The old back door opens right into his room from the yard, savvy? Billy Kane nodded his head shortly in affirmation. He took a cigarette from his pocket and lighted it nonchalantly. But, say, the elation in the gangster's voice was growing still more pronounced. That ain't all. The Pippin spotted his nibs through the window from the yard a few minutes ago. Say, what do you think, Bundy? The cripple hobbles across the room and pulls the old washstand away from the wall and lifts up an innocent-looking piece of the wallpaper that you'd think was stuck down for fair. The Pippin had only a rip in the window shade to see through, and he couldn't see very well. But he could see a dinky little hole there in the wall and a satchel inside, and the cripple takes something out of his pocket and slips it into the hole and smooths the wallpaper back again. The Pippin beat it out of there then, and found me, and he's just wised me up. It was quite dark here on the street, but even so Billy Kane kept his face turned slightly away from the gangster. The blood was racing in one mad, ungovernable flood of feverish excitement through his veins. It seemed somehow as though a weight that had been unendurable, an actual physical burden beyond his strength to bear, had suddenly been lifted from his shoulders. The man with the crutch! From the prior events of the evening, from what Red Vallon had just said, there was no possibility that the Pippin had stumbled upon another man with a crutch. This was the one, without question, without room for a single shadow of a doubt. And he as good as had the man now. He flicked the ash from his cigarette with his forefinger and nodded curtly again. "'Figure it out for yourself,' said Red Vallon, a sort of eager self-complacency in his voice. Of course, the man had nothing to do with that murder last night, but the police knew he was around there lugging a satchel, and you add to that the crook dump where he lives, and the guy that has a nifty little hiding place in the wall with a satchel in it, and where does he get off? I ain't throwing any bouquets at myself, Bundy, but I told you I'd pull something good this trip, and I guess you gotta hand it to me for delivering the goods. Pipe this, Bundy. The police think the Pippin's a stool pigeon anyhow. Well, five minutes ago, I sent the Pippin to tip off the police while I beat it up here to put you wise. Get me? With all that stuff against the guy, he ain't got a hope. He goes up for that murder, and that lets you out, Bundy. Billy Kane stood still. They had reached the cellar-like entrance to the rat's den, but he made no move to descend the short cavernous stairway. A little way up the block, the street lamp seemed suddenly to be swirling around and around in swift, lightning-like irregular flashes. The blood that had rushed hotly, madly through his veins but an instant before was cold and sluggish now, as though some icy tourniquet were at work upon his heart, stilling its action. That lets you out, Bundy. The words mocked and jeered at him, let him out. It was ruin, disaster death, unless in some way he could forestall this move of Red Vallon. He fought desperately for control of himself. That envelope, her threat, his own desire to get at the man, were like issues fading into the background. He knew that the man was the murderer of Peters, and if the police, whether they caught the man or not, found what he believed they would find in that satchel, some at least of those rubies from the Ellsworth vault, then Red Vallon, this mad standing here, who with horrible callousness, but equally with the genuine motive of protecting the rat, was ironically planning, while believing him innocent, to send the guilty man to his death, would know absolutely beyond question that the rat had not killed Peters last night, that last night's alibi was a lie, and that he, Billy Kane, was the man in the mask, at whose throat Red Vallon and his gang asked nothing better than to hurl themselves like a pack of starving wolves. To get rid of Red Vallon, any excuse, anything. To get rid of the man, without an instant's delay. He shoved out his hand to the gangster. I won't forget this, Red, he said earnestly. 
Take it from me. I won't forget it. But you beat it now, Red. That uh, Daler game went wrong tonight. The cadger will tell you about it if you see him. I haven't got a minute. See, Red? Sure. All right, agreed the gangster heartily. Well, so long, Bundy. Billy Kane shook hands again with a grip that was hard and eloquent. So long, Red, he said. The gangster turned away. Billy Kane dove down the stairs, opened the door of the den, locked it behind him, darted across the room in the darkness, and in another minute, crawling through the tunnel from the secret door, gained the shed and the street at the rear. He ran breathlessly now. What did it matter if anyone saw him? Time alone was all that counted. If he could not beat the police in the race to that room, he was as good as dead already. His mind worked swiftly, incisively, as he ran. The Pippin had, say, ten minutes' start, but it was only a few blocks to that house next to Marlitt's saloon, and it would take a little while, at least, for the police to make their preparations before acting on the Pippin's information. The chances lay with him, Billy Kane. The man might or might not be there. It did not matter in so far as the main issue was concerned. It was that handbag and its contents that were the vital factor now, and, yes, if he got that, the envelope, too, they would both almost certainly be in the same hiding place, inasmuch as that hiding place was a crafty one. If the man were there, then it seemed as though irony would have piled itself on irony tonight, for he would automatically, for the time being, become the ally of the man with whom he asked only a deadly reckoning. He did not want the police to get the man with the crutch. Whatever the story the man might tell to account for his connection with Peters, it was certain that he would not be fool enough to tell the truth about the murder of David Ellsworth. And if the police had the man with the crutch in custody, then he, Billy Kane, was irrevocably barred from that reckoning which he meant to have. He had been perhaps five minutes. He was trying the door now of a wretched two-story frame building that hugged as its right-hand neighbor a saloon that was almost as disreputable in appearance as itself. The door was unlocked. He stepped inside, and feeling his way in the darkness, but still moving rapidly, passed down a narrow hall. By the sense of touch he was aware that there were rooms on only one side, the left-hand side, and that there were two of them. He brought up abruptly against a door now that made the end of the passage, the door of the rear room of the house, obviously, and obviously, therefore, the home of the man with the crutch. It was silent everywhere in the house. He smiled a little grimly. He knew the place well enough by reputation to account for that silence. It was a crook's nest, a crook's lodging house, and being night, the tenants had gone to work. He slipped his mask over his face and rapped on the door. There was no answer. He rapped again, and then his skeleton keys came into play. The man had obviously returned here from Daler's to get rid of that envelope, though probably not at once, for it must have been then that the Pippin had seen him. But now, apparently, he had gone out again. The door yielded upon the trial of the third key. Billy Kane flung it open, stepped inside, and his flashlight played through the black. As he had expected, the room was empty. He locked the door again and crossed quickly to the rear door. This he found opened inward. He looked out. This took a few seconds, but an accurate knowledge of his surroundings was worth even more than that should he be caught here. The door opened on practically a level with the ground, and it had an old-fashioned latch with heavy iron handles loop-shaped below the thumb pieces. He closed the door and bolted it, smiling appreciatively, as he noted that the bolt moved both readily and silently, as though in carefully oiled grooves. His flashlight played around the room again now. The window shade was drawn. He located the washstand and frowned suddenly in perplexity. A crutch leaned against the washstand. His face cleared the next instant. Why shouldn't the man have an extra one? Uh, perhaps he had to buy them in pairs, though he used only one at a time. Billy Kane stepped swiftly to the washstand, and preparatory to pulling it away from the wall, lifted up the crutch, and the next instant was examining the latter critically. It was extremely heavy. He whistled low under his breath. It was not only a crutch, it was a murderous weapon. The shaft of the thing, though painted a wood color, was solid iron. He set it down and pulled out the washstand. 
Then, picking up the crutch again, he slashed it along the line of the wall where the washstand had been. A large piece of the wallpaper came away, disclosing a neatly constructed little hiding place, some two feet long by a foot in depth. A queer, twisted smile was on Billy Kane's lips. In there lay only two articles, but they were a manila envelope and a small handbag. He snatched up the envelope and tore it open. A glance at the faded writing was enough. It was Joe Lington's letter of twenty years ago. He stuffed it into his pocket, and almost more eagerly than before reached into the aperture again and took out the handbag. But now his fingers seemed to have gone clumsy with excitement as he fumbled with the catches. No, it was locked. Well, his steel jimmy would soon settle that. He pried the bag open and stood staring at its contents. And the contents were not rubies. And then he laughed a little as he lifted out and examined a package of banknotes. It did not matter, did it, the rubies or the money. It linked the man with the crutch, with the Ellsworth murder, just the same. This was the money, and apparently intact, that had been in the Ellsworth vault. The paper bands, pinned around the packages and marked in red ink with the amount in each package, had been pinned there and marked by himself. It was strange, very strange. He restored the steel jimmy to his pocket and attempted to fasten the bag with its end catches, but the frame had been bent in prying the bag open, and the catches would not work easily. It was very strange. How had this man with the crutch, so intimately connected with Peter's and David Ellsworth's murders, come also to be so intimately conversant with the crime trust's game with Daler? His mind kept striking off at tangents as he struggled with the bag. He could not carry a bag that would gape open. Once he got it to the den, the hole in the flooring that he had thought so futile a reward for his search would not be so futile after all. The bag would fit very nicely, and very securely, in there. Iron crutches weren't usually made in pairs. That was queer, too. Was it an iron crutch that was the blunt instrument that had caused Peter's death? And David Ellsworth's? Why had the man used that dummy envelope tonight, and— His flashlight was out. Footsteps were creeping cautiously along the hall outside. The police. The bag would have to do as it was now, but at least one catch was partially fastened. He tucked it under his arm, and for the fraction of a second, while he thrust the flashlight back into his pocket, he stood still. And then, a sudden curious smile on his lips— he reached out and picked up the crutch again, and stole silently over to the rear door. The smile was lost as his lips thinned into a straight line. Yes, they were already here, too. Well, the crutch might perhaps still serve the same purpose. His ear to the panel, a whisper reached him. Put your shoulder to it, Jerry, and push with me, when I get the bar in the crack of the door. All right, another voice whispered. The others will have been around at the front long ago. Are you ready? The door creaked under a sudden pressure, and as suddenly from the wall at the edge of the door Billy Kane reached out and released the bolt. The door swung violently open, and two figures, their balance lost, sprawled and staggered into the room. And in a flash Billy Kane, as he leaped through the doorway, snatched at the door, slammed it shut, jabbed the crutch as a lock bar through the iron loop of the door handle, its end extending well over the frame of the doorway, and sprinted across the yard. There was a yell and a battering thud on the door behind him as he reached a fence at the end of the yard, swung himself to the top, and dropped to the lane below. And then, as he ran, there came a crash of broken glass. They had evidently forsaken the door for the window. For a hundred yards Billy Kane ran at top speed along the lane, and then, removing his mask, the bag concealed under his coat, he emerged into the intersecting street and dropped into a casual and quiet stride. He smiled queerly. They would be looking for a cripple who, having sacrificed his crutch to save his life, could at best but limp and hobble painfully along. End of chapter 19